Dear friends, tonight I want to talk about magical idealism. Magical idealism is a term that Novalis used quite often, and it is key to an understanding of his life and his work. Rudolf Steiner placed great emphasis on Novalis, as you certainly know, and he pointed to Novalis in his last address, and he suggested that Novalis would be very important for the 21st century. Well, now we are 22 years into the 21st century, and in fact, 2022 is the 250th anniversary year of the birth of Novalis, who was born Friedrich von Hardenberg in Oberwiderstedt, Prussian Saxony, on May 2, 1772. Here is a picture of the carpentry shop in which Rudolf Steiner gave his last address in 1924. It is, of course, also the building where Rudolf Steiner celebrated the Christmas Conference, 1923 to 1924. Years that we are studying and remembering in our section work. One might feel that for Rudolf Steiner, perhaps two audiences were present in the carpentry shop at Michaelmas, 1924, when he delivered his incomplete last lecture. Or, for that matter, two audiences when he celebrated the Christmas conference. One audience were those persons whose earthly destinies led them to Dornach at that time. The second audience consisted of attentive but invisible listeners and colleagues yet to be born. Tonight, we begin with an introduction to magical idealism. But instead of taking a deep dive into philosophy, let's enter the world of the fairy tale. Novalis placed a great deal of importance on fairy tales as portals to magical idealism and poetry. Much of what Novalis says about the spiritual importance of fairy tales is echoed by Rudolf Steiner 100 years after the death of Novalis. Steiner builds upon the insights of Novalis in that regard. Here is one important representative quote from Rudolf Steiner, and I'll read it. There is a great difference in whether or not one has, as a child, grown up with fairy tales the soul-stirring nature of fairy tale pictures, becomes evident only later on. If fairy tales have not been given, this shows itself in later years in weariness of life, in boredom. Indeed, it even comes to expression physically. Fairy tales can help counter illnesses. What is absorbed little by little by means of fairy tales, emerges subsequently as joy in life, in the meaning of life. It comes to light in the ability to cope with life, even into old age. Children must experience the power inherent in fairy tales while young, while they can still do so. Whoever is not capable of living with ideas that have no reality for the physical plane dies for the spiritual world. Those, those are very strong words, are they not? And if you're a parent or grandparent like me, they might make you run to the bedroom to read a fairy tale to your youngster. <laughs> but, but wait a minute. One of the most liberating insights of Novalis is that the fairy tale is not just for children. Every adult needs to hear a true fairy tale in the right way. Every adult has an angel child inside or on his or her shoulders, an angel child who needs to hear a true fairy tale repeatedly. Here's a picture by William Blake 
Blake and Novalis have a lot in common, don't they? <laughs> they were contemporaries. You might say they were spiritual brothers. So imagine while you are looking at this picture that you too are carrying on your shoulders an angel child such as this. Is the child happy, sad, frightened, worried, angry, sick? Is the child in a bad mood? Is the angel child having a fit? Here is another quote. It is a bit of wisdom that Rudolf Steiner received from his mentor, Carl Julius Scherer, who in turn received the wisdom from the writings of one of the brothers Grimm. Fairy tales and sagas are comparable to a good angel, granted human beings, as a companion from birth, on their life wanderings, to be a trustworthy comrade throughout, offering comradeship, and making life inwardly into a truly ensouled fairy tale. I just want to linger for a moment on that phrase, that last phrase, a truly ensouled fairy tale. Meditate that phrase, consider it deeply, and take it deeply into your sleep. There is, I think, hardly a better definition of magical idealism as Novalis taught it. One of the things I like to say to annoy people and wake them up is, the fairy tale is mightier than philosophy. Uh, there's a reason I say that be beyond being a wise guy. In the old days, when I talked about magical idealism, I always put on my impressive scholarly hat and cloak and took out my PhD from the University of California and talked about highfalutin German philosophy. I did this because Novalis took that approach in his life. He studied Fichte and Kant and German idealist philosophy quite intensely, as you may know. He was friends with many of those famous philosophers. In fact, Fichte was fostered by the Hardenberg family and relatives, and more about that at a later time, perhaps. But when Hardenberg became Novalis, he stopped chewing on philosophy and he said more or less, well, now I'm finished with it. I have left those books of philosophy on the shelf. Rest in peace. What did he mean? Well, for one thing, he meant that he had gone as far on the path of philosophy as philosophy could take him. He had reached the end point of philosophy, and he had become a poet. And when he arrived there in the land of poetry, he began to say that the fairy tale, not philosophy, was the highest form of literature. The fairy tale is mightier than philosophy. It's a catchy phrase. Now, before we get all excited and put on our debating shorts and boxing gloves, let's look at what Novalis meant by the word poet. For Novalis, a poet is not someone who writes clever verses or publishes poems in prestigious or less than prestigious magazines or I don't know, someone who acts like a sage or a prophet or public entertainer or a soul therapist. Uh, no, no. Poet for Novalis means what we are all presumably striving to become. That is to say, free and ethical, spiritually awake human beings, active in whatever context life has placed us. Isn't that maybe what drew you to anthroposophy once upon a time? For Novalis, we are all of us poets, potentially. Here is that quote from Heinrich von Ofterdingen, words spoken to young Heinrich, a.k.a. Novalis, by the master poet Klingsor. Novalis, through the character Klingsor, is telling us that to become magical idealists or poets, we have to exercise our innately human poetic nature. You must wake up. Wake up to the miracle of the human mind and to the fact that we are all doing poetry all the time, as Novalis told us, for better or worse.
Fairy tales that heal us. Fairy tales that make us sick. And again, here's another quote from the magical idealist Novalis that makes the same point. And we find this same teaching throughout Novalis everywhere. For example, I don't know, in the fairy tale Hyacinth and Rosebud, or in the fairy tale Atlantis. We have worked with each of these in our section meetings. They are magical idealist how-to manuals, I like to say, and I've made them available in fresh translations for the 21st century, along with Goethe's fairy tale, of course. Uh, this is one that Rudolf Steiner called the germinal seed of the anthroposophical movement. I also made them available as performance videos that feature section members reading. And like I said, these and many other texts that Novalis wrote are how-to manuals for those who want to learn the art of magical idealism, or to say it in other words, for those who want to learn to become poets in this spiritual human sense. Or if, if you really need some philosophy to make you happy, you can read my long essay on magical idealism. It's on the website. But back to poetry. Let's fast track, as we like to say in California, and zoom to the fairy tale Hyacinth and Rosebud. The fairy tale Hyacinth and Rosebud is found almost right in the middle of the Apprentices of Sice. And that's a book which is filled with brainy conversations about nature, and the relationship of the human being to nature. Nature and loving poetic appreciation for nature is, of course, very important to Novalis, as it was to Goethe, as it was to Rudolf Steiner. Nature enlivens us with the proper mood for the fairy tale. Nature can heal and instruct us. But if we are chattering all the time like college students excited about ideas and intellectual insights and games of intellectual gotcha, then we don't have the quiet soul mood to hear the soft voice of nature. We are stuck in the loud chatter of our personalities, and the angel child on our shoulder gets bored or sick or sulks and won't talk to us. That is why the fairy tale Hyacinth and Rosebud begins with the words, Poor child, who has not yet loved? Poor child. The hero of the fairy tale, Hyacinth, is a good illustration of this point. Hyacinth is melancholic. He worries about this little nothing and that little nothing, Novalis tells us. <laughs> of course, the little nothings appear quite big to him. They always do. And when a mysterious stranger, a grand master of occult lore and esoteric wisdom and deep insights arrives in town, Hyacinth immediately is besotted and fascinated. Oh, tell me the deep secrets of creation, master. Give me the key to all mythologies. I am unworthy. So naturally, the mysterious stranger takes Hyacinth under his wing and initiates him into all sorts of occult lore. He even gives him a special book. It is the most special book ever. It's so special and so deeply cool and awesome and wise, and it contains such incredible secrets about creation and the human being that no human being can read it, Novalis says. Now, of course, Hyacinth is head over heels. He spends all his time with the teacher, and they go on long walks, and they have deep conversations. They even descend deep into mine shafts in search of secrets. But at the same time, Hyacinth becomes more and more miserable. In fact, 
he becomes so miserable that he loses interest in life. He becomes a sourpuss, and he turns his back on his sweetheart, Rosebud, and on his loving parents, and he suffers and grows depressed and becomes more and more estranged from the world. Then, Novalis tells us, in a stroke of good luck and happy karma, Hyacinth meets the wise old woman in the forest, who says, Ha! Huh, show me that stranger's special book. So Hyacinth shows it to her, and what does the old woman do? She burns the book right there in front of him. She burns the special book. She takes the most secret book of high esoteric wisdom ever written, and she burns it right in front of the young man's disbelieving eyes. Oh, no, cries Hyacinth. <laughs> but the wise old woman, Novalis tells us, gives Hyacinth a good dose of enlightenment right on the spot, and the lad is changed. In other words, she frees Hyacinth for his individual, magical, idealist quest. Of course, Hyacinth goes from one extreme to the other. <laughs> oh, he's young, and how he does bang about. He runs home and tells his devoted parents he is leaving. He tells his devoted girlfriend, Rosebud, I'm leaving. So you see, although he is freed from the glamour of the stranger's book, which he thought he could substitute for lived experience. He is still in delusion about many things, and most of all, about himself. But that is the nature of enlightenment, is it not? It proceeds step by step. Just when you think you have it figured out, oh no, back to the beginning, back to once upon a time. So Hyacinth's he leaves home and begins his quest for the great mother, the goddess Isis, the veiled goddess who guards the true secret, the open secret of life and nature and human being. Hyacinth wanders about like a Parsifal, one might say. His most important moments of learning and initiation occur when he keeps quiet and listens and remains all alone with himself and with nature. During those special moments of stillness and silence, he sits down and shuts up. <laughs> He's not like Faust in that regard. Faust hardly ever sits down and shuts up. He's always restless. He has to be. <laughs> That's the pact that he made with the devil. But Hyacinth does keep still. And when he does, he falls into the deep silence of the questioning that begins and guides the quest. In other words, he becomes like the Dumpkin character in fairy tales. He listens to flowers. He talks to birds and clouds. He learns to sit and breathe and pay attention to the inner world that is the outer world. He learns the art of boredom. And he begins to intuit the lemniscate that weaves between the eye of the human being and nature, the outer world. Like a Parsifal, dropping the reins of his horse and allowing the horse to find its way without interference, Hyacinth slowly becomes quiet enough and receptive enough and childlike wise enough to find his way to the grail. In this case, the grail is the veiled goddess Isis. He arrives at the still center of the turning wheel. And what does he discover there? <laughs> well, now you need to either read the fairy tale for yourself, or watch the video, or, I don't know, maybe have tea and take a nap. You, you could also listen to a recorded translation of the fairy tale Atlantis. It's good to hear fairy tales read to you, I believe. Novalis had confidence that we could become poets 
because we are all poets already. It's baked into the iOS, as they say. Novalis had confidence that we could wake up and that if we did wake up to our poet human nature, we would discover that the spiritual world is in fact already open to us. It is always open. If we were to become suddenly so flexible to be perceive it, we would perceive ourselves in the midst of the spiritual world. And maybe that's one reason Rudolf Steiner emphasized Novalis so much as he did in the last address. Well, thank you for your attention and for your interest in this section for the Literary Arts and Humanities and for your interest in Novalis and Romanticism. Good night. <laughs>